Memphis, Memphis, Tennessee, a need, a need, a telephone call to Dr. Martin Luther King and his aides, a talk to his children, his parents, and a final goodbye from Coretta. On to Memphis, on to Memphis, the airport, on to Memphis. In Memphis, he is greeted by a delegation of sanitation workers, sanitation workers that cried out for help. Poor working conditions, low salaries, racial discrimination, segregation, and daily insults. This was Memphis in the year of our Lord, 1968. The crowd is gathering at the Mason Temple, and the singing could be heard from a distance. Reverend King is entering now along with the other ministers. Reverend Abernathy speaks. I want to thank the citizens of Memphis for the hospitality that has been shown toward us. I know you did not come here tonight to hear Ralph Abernathy. You came here tonight to hear Brother President, and here he is, the President of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the Honorable Dr. Martin Luther King, Junior. Thank you, Reverend Abernathy. That's the question before you tonight. Not if I stop to help the sanitation workers, what will happen to all of the hours that I usually spend in my office every day and every week as a pastor. The question is not if I stop to help this man in need what will happen to me if I do not stop to help the sanitation workers? What will happen to them? That's the question. Let us rise up tonight with a greater readiness. Let us stand with a greater determination and let us move on in these powerful days, these days of challenge to make America what it ought to be. We have an opportunity to make America a better nation. And I want to thank God once more for allowing me to be here with you. You know, several years ago, I was in New York City autographing the first book that I had written. And while sitting there autographing books, a demented black woman came up. The only question I heard from her was, are you Martin Luther King? And I was looking down writing, and I said, yes. And the next minute, I felt something beating on my chest. And before I knew it, I had been stabbed by this demented woman. I was rushed to Harlem Hospital. It was a dark Saturday afternoon. And the blade had gone through, and the x-rays revealed that the tip of the blade was on the edge of my aorta the main artery. Once that's punctured, you drown in your own blood. That's the end of you. It came out in the New York Times the next morning that if I had sneezed, I would have died. Well, about four days later, they allowed me, after the operation, after my chest had been opened and the blade had been taken out, to move around in the wheelchair in the hospital. They allowed me to read some of the mail that came in. And from all over the states and the world, kind letters came in. I read a few, but one of them I will never forget. I received one from the president and the vice president. 
I've forgotten what those telegrams said. I'd received the letter and the visit from the governor of New York. I've forgotten what that letter said, but there was another letter. It came from a little girl, a young girl who was a student at the White Plains High School. I looked at that letter and I will never forget it. It said simply, Dear Dr. King, I am a ninth grade student at the White Plains High School. And while it should not matter, I would like to mention that I am a white girl. I read of your misfortune and of your suffering, and I read that if you would have sneezed, you would have died. And I am simply writing to say that I'm so happy that you did not sneeze. And I'd like to say tonight, I'd like to say that I'm happy that I didn't sneeze. Because if I would have sneezed, I wouldn't have been around here in 1960 when students all over the South began to sit in at lunch counters. And I knew as they were sitting in, they were really standing up for the best in the American dream and taking the whole nation back to those great walls of democracy, which were dug deep by the founding fathers of the Declaration of Independence and of the Constitution. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around in 1961 when we decided to take a ride for freedom and end its segregation in interstate travel. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around in 1962 when Negroes in Albany, Georgia decided to straighten their backs up. And when men and women straighten their backs up, they're going somewhere because a man can't ride your back unless it is bent. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around in 1963 when the black people in Birmingham, Alabama aroused the nation's conscience and brought into being the Civil Rights Bill. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have had the chance later that year in August to try to tell America about a dream that I had had. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been down in Selma, Alabama to see the great movement there. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been in Memphis to see a community rally around those brothers and sisters who are suffering. I'm so happy that I didn't sneeze. And they were telling me, now it doesn't matter now. It really doesn't matter what happens now. I left Atlanta this morning and as we got started on the plane, there were six of us. The pilot said over the public address system, we are sorry for the delay, but we have Dr. Martin Luther King on the plane. And to be sure that all the bags were checked and to be sure that nothing would go wrong with the plane, we have had the plane protected and guarded all night. And then I got into Memphis and some began to say the threats or talk about the threats that were out. What would happen to me from some of our sick white brothers? Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop and I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord.
Tonight, I want you to sing, precious Lord, and I want you to sing it real good for me. Did you hear me? I said tonight, I want you to sing, precious Lord, and I want you to sing it real good for me. All right, now. <laughs> County. Need two emergency units. Need an ambulance. Subject still on foot. Dr. King's been shot. The speech is over. Reverend King, Reverend Abernathy, Jesse Jackson, and Andrew Young, back to the Lorraine Hotel. April the 4th, 1968. A bright, busy day. Another day. For over 4,900 days, Martin Luther King Jr. had led and participated in marches, and now in Memphis, marching for freedom. In times like this, there was always a song. The march has ended. A tired Martin, Lu Martin Luther King Jr. stood on the balcony of the Lorraine Hotel in Memphis, Tennessee, and spoke to a friend. Then a blast. And a cry, Martin Luther King Jr. has been shot. Martin Luther King Jr. has been shot. Martin Luther King Jr. is dead. A complete silence, then a thought. A nation mourns, a president weeps, movie sets were closed down, flags half mast ordered by the President of the United States. America wept, a world wept. Senator Robert Kennedy sent an airplane to Memphis to take his body home to Atlanta. Home, home, home to Atlanta, Georgia. Footsteps and memories. Footsteps and memories. Old trouble, old trouble, why? They are coming now. 
It's the final march for the dreamer. The wagon symbolizing his love for the poor and downtrodden. Harry Belafonte is with Coretta King, who is dressed in black, and the children in white. A nation mourns, children weep, teenagers mourn, and adults mournfully remember. The Kennedy family, senators, representatives, movie stars, and leaders from all over the world are here. Memories, memories, memories. Oh, precious memories, how they linger. Mahana Jackson is going to sing Precious Lord. Reverend Ralph Abernathy speaks. Martin Luther King Jr. was a man of nonviolence. Like Gandhi, he met a violent death. He had conquered his fear over death. He knew that a man who is not free inside himself could not understand freedom. In 1964, Dr. Gunnar Hunt of the Norwegian Nobel Peace Prize Committee 
said that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was the first person in the Western world to have shown us that a struggle can be won without violence. Martin Luther King Jr. was my closest and dearest friend. I followed his leadership. I respected him and I learned from him. His dream his vision and his contributions will live forever. Behold the dream that men would live together as brothers. They have killed the dreamer, but they can't kill the dream. I repeat, they have killed the dreamer, but not the dream. He's free. Martin Luther King Jr. is free. He's free. He's 